Oh. Two crows just flew right over my head. <laughs> right over my head. That was amazing. Um, what was I saying? It's cold today. It's proper cold. When I was last sitting on this park bench talking to you, it was, uh, gosh, the end of September, and it was really nice sunny weather. We had a really nice long summer here in the UK, but it suddenly turned and suddenly went really cold, and today it's like a proper winter day, which isn't surprising because it is proper winter. So, anyway, all these cameras. Well, it started when I was three years old, and I'll show you the very camera that started my fascination with photography. It was the camera my dad used to use. He used this from the early 60s onwards, right throughout, uh, right up until the late 80s when he bought a different camera. This was the one that he used for years and years and years and years and years, and this was the one that took all our family shots, all our holiday shots. This has got all, you know, little three-year-old Nigel on it. Um, I'll try and dig some of those out for you. These were all shot with this camera. It's a Pentona and uh, it's a fairly simple thing. I think it's a Pentacon point and shoot of the day. It's a fairly simple thing, but to me at that time, wow, this looked like quite the tech. This just looked astonishing and I just couldn't you know couldn't get my head around what a fantastic machine it was I'd see my dad kneeling down with it there in front of us um, shooting the image and then uh, a couple of weeks later we'd get back the um, images that he'd shot in uh, a little packet a nice little wallet and uh, suddenly there were some images and I just couldn't believe it it was astonishing here was a machine it became clear here was a machine that made images and uh, I don't think I've ever quite recovered <laughs> from learning that all those years ago. So there was I, three-year-old kid fascinated by cameras. Now what would you do if you were my dad? Would you give me your camera to play with? No I don't think so. What my dad did <coughs> was he very kindly went out and bought me my own camera, a camera that was suitable to three-year-old fingers and wouldn't matter too much if it got a little bit damaged or dropped or whatever else three-year-old kids might be likely to do with things. And uh, it was, uh, you can still get these cameras today, it was a Diana camera. Uh, it wasn't called a Diana, it was actually labelled Banier, B-A-N-I-E-R. Um, and I, I know that because I was learning to read at the time. I was three, four years old. I was learning to read at the time and managed to make out these letters. Um, I never really used it. Uh, Dad put some film in it for me, but I immediately spoiled it by removing the back and wanted to, wanting to see uh, how the pictures got inside. Um, I, I, but, you know, that doesn't matter. It was a first camera and Dad delighted me by bringing it home one night from Woolworths where he bought it for sixpence. That's how much these cameras cost at the time. The Diana camera, which is now sub such an object of veneration, was then a toy. It was just a toy camera um, and you could buy them for sixpence. It, kind of the equivalent of, I don't know, £4.99 today. A very, very, very cheap thing. Not expected to last long. Not expected to give uh, much uh, good service, but, uh, you know, might make you an image or two before it conked out. So that was my first camera and it was a wondrous machine, even though I didn't use it too much. If you want to buy one of these today, uh, it'll probably cost you, I don't know, around 40 to 60 pounds maybe is that what they go for i think i've seen them go for that um don't buy one because they're not very good they're a plastic thing they're a toy camera from the 60s they've got a plastic lens if you want to play around with one and i appreciate it, it might be a bit of fun don't pay any more than a five or four one because they're not worth it but they can be a bit of fun so what's next on my list? Well, 
I don't know what happened after that because there was a bit of a hiatus in my photography journey. There you go, I said it. I said journey. There was a hiatus and it wasn't until I was round about 11 years old, I think, that I came to my next camera and that was a Polaroid. So what we thought was, this was you know me and dad thinking about this what we thought was well it's such a pain waiting for negs to be developed it's such a pain waiting waiting around and uh, not being able to see your results this is the 70s man we've been to the moon let's get teched up let's go instant photography so we did and uh so christmas 75 or 76 around then I got this camera super color swinger which I think means something a bit different now to what it did then so the Polaroid super color swinger well that was a real uh, interesting camera um, yes it made instant images but gosh you did have to work at getting them I thought it would be rather better than it was it, it was actually a snapshot camera it wasn't pretending to be anything other than a snapshot camera but I didn't really know that I didn't really know too much about photography at the time um, I thought that it, it looked quite a, quite a technical tour de force and I guess it was in some ways and uh, I thought, well, that one will do fine. So uh, it used, uh, I think it was, it was either 80 or 88 peel apart film. Very messy film. You'd get the chemicals on your fingers, uh, no matter what you tried to do. Uh, it didn't work very well in low light. Even the light we've got today, which is, you know, the usual hopelessly cloudy grey light we get in the UK in the winter. Even in that light, still plenty of light around, but it didn't like to shoot. It was a bit too dark for it. Um, I spent a year with that camera. I did make some nice images with it, but I could see that there were better ones that were possible um, to use. I could see there were better ways to make images and... I could see already this wasn't going to cut it. So a year later, wait one year, one year of Polaroid joy and horror, joy and or horror, bit of joy, bit of horror later, and uh, Christmas 1977, I think it was, I became acquainted with the Fed 4. And that was really where it all took off that was my first proper camera that was my first interchangeable lens camera not that i did interchange any len any lenses i just used the Industar 61 for years and years and years but just to know that it was possible to interchange lenses and to occasionally take it off and put it back on well now that made me feel like a proper flipping photographer this was a camera that was sensitive to exposure you could make adjustments you could tune it you could control it as you wanted it to be controlled and you could make the image that you wanted to make so that was a massive step up for me and it was my introduction to the like a thread mount system because uh, the Ukrainian uh, range finders like the Fed and the Russian ones like the Zorkis, those are all essentially LTM cameras. So it's my introduction to that system and I still have LTL, uh, LTM cameras. I've uh, graduated to some Leica ones but I've also still got a nice collection of Ukrainian and, Soviet, um, and Russian ones because I like them. They're nice cameras, they're cool cameras and this, the Fed 4, this was the camera I learned photography on. Now you can still buy these cameras, there's loads of them around, they were made in the millions and millions and millions and you know economies of scale aren't in it, they're so cheap you can buy one of these for £20 easily, you can buy them 20 quid all day long in good working order and these are proper 
cameras. Yes, they're 1930s tech. Yes, they're old fashioned. Yes, they're all manual. There's no automation at all, but that's a good thing if you're learning. You need to learn about light. You need to learn about why your camera does what it does. So they're great for people to learn on. If you want to learn photography, not just film photography, any photography, these are great to learn on. Um, and they're also great if you, you know, you're coming back to photo uh, film photography. Um, <clears throat> If you're an experienced photographer, because you're in control with one of these cameras, there's uh, the, there's no room for um, you know the camera doing anything. The photographer does everything, and it's a really nice experience. And you can really end up being bonded to this machine that you're using. So a great experience. I highly recommend these cameras still, um, as you can tell, because here I am highly recommending them quite highly uh, so that must count for something um, yeah if you, if you want a great manual film camera get one of these if you want to try like a style not quite the same but like a style range find a photography try one of these and then graduate see if you like it fantastic little machine uh, and still fantastic today Right, another hiatus, another photographic hiatus. Sounds like a medical condition. Have you had that photographic hiatus examined by a doctor? I'm sorry to have to tell you, sir, you have photographic hiatus. What am I talking about? Anyway, another photographic hiatus ensued. And that took me to about 1997, late 90s. And at that time, film was still dominant and I fancied an SLR. I got the photography bug back after I'd lost it for a few years and I got the photography bug back and I thought, well, that old rangefinder, it's done me good service. But it's an old rangefinder, and not only that, it's a very old-fashioned rangefinder. So I decided to go right to the top of the technical tree and get an SLR. Uh, unfortunately, I only climbed as high. I only climbed so high in the technical tree to get a Practica SLR, and they weren't very teched up at the time. It's, I, I ended up with an LTL5, I think, or an MTL3, or one of the LTL MTL cameras. And uh, I bought that second hand just to see what an SLR would be like, whether I'd like an SLR. As it happened, I really liked it, and I shot the flipping heck out of that camera for the next six months and it had a really really nice lens on it now I didn't know about Carl Zeiss Jena lenses at the time but looking back at those shots I reckon it must have had a nice CZJ on it because they're just fantastic shots anyway I enjoyed that camera for six months it was a reliable mechanical camera it was nothing particularly special no particular high tech in it it was a little bit large um, it wasn't terribly polished but it was reliable and it was capable and it did take m42 lenses so in theory i could have put other lenses on it i didn't because i hadn't got the lens bug at the time but i could have put other lenses on it so that was a real nice camera and I enjoyed using that. I especially enjoyed the fact that it only cost me a pound because it was a time when they were starting to be really cheap and uh, I managed to get it for a pound but it didn't last long. It didn't last long. It was left and this was a slightly, uh, there was a, a, a small political situation developed about this. It was left on a hill in Castleton in Derbyshire by Mrs. Z in 1998 and uh, so if you found one or if you're out for a walk today in Castleton and you happen to see a Practica camera on a hill 
it could well be that one so if you want one of those cameras today a practica again they're really cheap usually you'll get uh, a practica lens on it which is a nice optic of 50 mil 1.8 and camera and lens will cost you about 20 30 maybe 40 pounds if you uh, if you get unlucky but I wouldn't think they go much higher than that so these are real cool cameras to buy and they're really good to use they remind me actually although they're not as polished let's have a sit down and rest my bones although they're not as polished they do remind me a little bit of the Nikon FM camera that's the manual one isn't it yeah the FM in the they're bulky they're simple they're not technically complex in any any meaningful way but they're reliable they've got everything you need and nothing you don't so it's that kind of approach and if you want one 20 to 40 pounds a nice camera and that reminds me of my next camera actually after that was another practica a bc1 that was the electronic version and that had a lot of auto features in it auto exposure um and so i bought a bc1 i bought that for 50 quid with a 135 a 28 and a 50 mil lens plus a zoom lens so that was about a you know a fair price for the time um and those the bc ones the practica bc ones are really are outstanding little cameras um lovely little thing very small size uh very um uh, feel very good in the hand some very nice lenses although there are one or two uh not so great lenses in 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 that line in practica b mount but there are some fantastic ones as well now i had a couple of those practica b cameras especially the bc ones and what i found with them is that although they were beautiful little cameras really really nice little bits of kit they weren't very reliable i found that the um, so they, they had a fault and both of mine had a fault developed a fault where they would drain the batteries very very quickly whether you were using the camera or not and uh, so that's what killed both of those but great cameras while they were working but I did find those two not terribly reliable having s oh two crows just flew right over my head right over my head that was amazing um what was i saying yeah if you want to buy one of these now 20 to 50 pounds for a nice practica bc1 camera you'll probably find actually that most of the unreliable ones have been sifted out by now and what are left are reliable um and i know there is a guy who reconditions and services these cameras still um so you know they can be repaired and they can be fixed up lovely little machines but not quite as reliable as some of the western ones now after that point where's my mic now after the practica bc1 uh journey escapade event uh i went digital this would this is now the early 2000s we're about 03 04 i went digital the Nikon D80 was my instrument of choice and my gosh that was a cool little camera I think I paid 600 quid for it at that time it wasn't cheap but it was a very 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 nice little camera 10 megapixel you really don't need any more didn't do any video at that time it was just a camera um, I had uh, I think it was an 18 to 135 on it it was APS-C so so those lengths are a, a, a bit longer um, and beautiful beautiful colors some of the nicest colors I've seen uh, from a digital camera actually very pumped up very saturated just how I like them I know that it's not supposed to be to uh, a professional taste to have poppy saturated colors but 
I just think they're fantastic. I don't see the point of having colours. You know, if you're going to have colours, why not have, have pumped up ones? And that seems to be in the nature of colours to me. And the D80 gave them to me. Well, now, you can still buy D80s. They're a nice little camera still. And I guess you could buy one very cheap, actually. You can buy one for about £100, I think. Next came a D90. Staying with Nikon, I got a little scratch on the D80 and it drove me round the bend. I couldn't bear this little scratch that I got on the body of my one-year-old D80. So I sold it and bought a D90, which I thought would be better and I thought would be uh, useful because it did uh, video clips and I was doing a lot of movie making around that time. Um, and they were nice video clips, only five minutes with lots of jelly shutter, but if you shot it right, it did a nice uh, video shot. But I didn't like the colours. The colours were toned down from what the D80 had, and I just didn't like them. They were very much, they were muted, they were a little bit muddy, there didn't seem to be any brightness or joy about them. So I only used that camera for about a year until, was it about a year? No, it wasn't. I used that camera for quite a while, actually, but I still never liked the colours. Um, and I graduated from that camera unwisely, not because it's a bad camera, but, but because it didn't really suit my purposes, unwisely graduated to a Panasonic GH2. Um, it did fantastic video, stills very, uh, very muted. Never liked the colours on that camera, even worse than the D90. So I went from one uh, camera whose colours I didn't like to another camera whose colours I didn't like. And it was, uh, you know, it was all going a bit wrong by this point. The GH2, although it, you know, I did make some nice video with it. I wasn't just shooting stills at the time. Uh, and I did make some nice video with it, but even so, the stills were just flipping awful, um, and still are, and I can't get any decent colour out of that camera unless it's under a photography light, which is a very, very cold photography light. That's the only way I can get it to make decent colours. Doing that, it makes fantastic colours. So great with photography lights, but not... not uh, so great with photography lights, but not much cop with anything else for the poor GH2. I've just realised I'm walking on wet grass. I'm going to get my feet wet. Never mind. So, where could I go from here? I'd come through film, through uh, started at 120 film with a, a, a Diana. Uh, I've gone Polaroid, I've done 35mm, I'd been with rangefinders, with SLRs, DSLRs and now a mirrorless. And none of them I'd found were just exactly uh, the right camera for me. So what could I do? Well, 2013 I think we're up to by now. We've moved quite some way in time and I think we're around about 2013 and finally the camera that I had been waiting for finally the camera that would give me a a small body a full frame sensor and it would shoot all the old lenses as well just like the GH2 had done but at their original intended focal length so they behave themselves just on on the full frame sensor just as they did on film all those years ago and yep it was the Sony a7 my lovely a7 with which I've made gosh nearly a hundred thousand shots now this is where it all went mad so if I'm trying to if I'm trying to keep in mind any order of progression of what cameras I've used what lenses I've used this is where it all goes mad because this a7 uh, with this A7, I began the channel, the, the, this uh, channel you're watching now, and uh, I've used hundreds of lenses and tens, maybe hundreds of cameras 
since so I can't really chart the journey from that point journey I said it again um, so there we are there's there's me from three years old right up to uh, right up to being uh, gosh pretty much 50 or so um, and uh, my my photographic development my photographic progression I'll say it again my photographic journey there you, I've said it three times now and as the bellman says in the hunting of the snark what I tell you three times is true so there we are what have we learned today I don't know what have we done today I don't know no I do know we've got very very cold I've got very very cold you're all right you're nice and warm in your nice little bed tucked up in your little bed or sitting on your sitting on your sofa with all your blanket around your feet and your central heating on but me I'm here at the cold face making videos to keep you entertained so I hope you've enjoyed it um, all right so that's it from me for this week uh, I do hope this episode has been useful I hope it's been of at least a little entertainment value please do chuck us a sub ring the bell like subscribe and do all those youtubey type things if you are motivated and inspired so to do please that would help the channel thanks to subscribers many thanks for subscribing and supporting us through your subscription thanks to patrons many thanks for many thanks for your support through your patronage we couldn't do what we do without that support it, it really does keep the channel doing what it does so many thanks for that i think that's it from me for now i'm going to go scurry in fact is what i'm going to do scurry back and uh, back into the warm and um, make sure i've not lost any digits or appendages in this perishing jolly cold so thanks for joining me and uh, if you're not doing anything next week Sunday afternoon please do join me for some more xenography cheerio all